Welcome to the Future of Tourism podcast. I'm David Peacock. Stop owning your own content. Young leaders are stepping up. Bring everyone to the table. And imagine their world anew. I had the honor to attend the annual Tourism Impact Sustainability Summit last month in Victoria. It struck me just how very many things we need to do well and get right in the next phase of destination development. The future of successful destinations, destinations that are thriving, sustainable, regenerative, egalitarian, animated, open, and safe. That possible future involves so many complex and interconnected parts before it could become a reality. But what I witnessed in Victoria was a testament to the fact that human beings are incredibly agile builders, aggregators, and innovators. Engaged communities of tourism stakeholders around the world have been shaping a collective and regenerative tourism model for decades now. Flanders, Belgium, Victoria, BC, the Bay of Plenty, New Zealand, all come to mind. Transformational opportunities arise when motivated tourism stakeholders work together to envision and realize a vibrant tourism future for their destination. That cross-pollination often starts as a spark inside the DMO and moves outward, but almost as often it starts with a player, a venue, an event, an attraction, or a happening outside the DMO. Frontiers North is one of those sparks. Founded by Merv and Linda Gunter in 1987 in Churchill, Manitoba, and focused on the relationship between people and the land, Frontiers North believes it is a privilege to share this awe-inspiring land with visitors from around the world and deliver on that mandate they have indeed for the past 30 years plus. Their polar bear tundra buggy experience is world-renowned and has garnered more awards than I can count. We're here to talk about a spark that happened for his parents, Merv and Linda, a spark that changed the future of Churchill, Manitoba, a spark that it has literally been said by many, put Churchill, Manitoba on the map. Good morning, John Gunter. How are you? Where are you? What's it like? Well, good morning to you, David. I'm coming to you from our Frontiers North Adventures head office here in Winnipeg, Canada. What's it like? What is it like? Oh, it's a lovely day outside. I cycled to work. I had my dog trotting along beside me. Is that a usual work uh, routine for you? I uh, sure, sure. I'll say yes. Yeah, <laughs> very good. Hey, we we had a chance to speak in Victoria. We were both at the Impact Conference. It, it was a phenomenal event. Um, I, I, we talked a little bit about this in our last conversation, but I mean, it is it is amazing to see the minds that get together to think about sustainability. It does give me hope. It also reinforces the absolute complexity of really sophisticated destination development and management with an eye on on not just sustainability but regeneration but that that conference was great any any thoughts on that just before we get started yeah you know coming out of coming out of impact um i really was trying to find a way to positively phrase as opposed to saying decarbonization and decolonization as opposed to saying what it wasn't, I wanted to say what it is. I still haven't figured out how to do that yet. So, but when I'm explaining the conference to colleagues and why I think it's so, it's so important, I end up talking about these themes that we uh, regularly discuss about reducing our carbon emissions and our carbon footprint and our role in reconciliation. And I think Impact does a great job of, of uh, addressing those important topics head on. It's true. And, and I mean, you get a little insight also to some of the technologies behind how we're going to achieve that sort of sustainability, which is where we which is where we first intersected, because it was the on screen pictures of your utterly magnificent electric tundra buggies, which are like as close to what you would envision as a child's idea of a moon buggy as possible. That was exciting. You've, you've been running those for 30 plus years. But in the last year, you made a major research and development concerted effort to rebuild them as electric. Yeah. Yeah, so the idea we we talked about, you know, for years we had talked about what would be the next the next cool thing, the next important development 
in our tours and activity business of, of our Tundra Buggy tours and adventures. And in 2018, uh, the discussions gained traction and we started working with a college here in Winnipeg and some other partners in the electric vehicle industry in Winnipeg and, uh, and our own team and developing what we rolled out in autumn 2021 onto the rugged tundra near Churchill, Manitoba as the far first ever electric vehicle tundra buggy. Okay, I, and I want to get into that because that is the genesis of this story, and it's pretty exciting when you get to it and to, to see it. Um, it it's kind of cool and majestic and, and futuristic, and at the same time, uh, blends in and non obtrusive if, if something that big can. But anyway, but I realized in talking to you the other day, we really can't talk about Churchill, Manitoba, without talking about the evolution of Frontiers North. And uh, as I said in my intro. Um, you know, often the spark for engagement comes from the DMO, but just as often it comes from outside the DMO. And when you guys arrived in Churchill, Manitoba, first time it was what, like 1984 or five? Yeah. So my my dad was a Royal Bank manager for uh, and transferred up to Churchill. And our family was stationed there from 1982 to 1986. So I was I was just a little rug rat at that time. And upon the family moving back from Churchill to Winnipeg in southern Manitoba, about a thousand kilometers south from Churchill. My folks looked at each other, having recognized the opportunity that tourism represents in Churchill that was just getting off the ground at the time and decided to start Frontiers North Adventures, which initially, uh, you know, marketed and sold and guided these, uh, these multi-day group trips to Churchill to experience the beluga whales there and the polar bears there you know before the internet putting together these these resources and taking out and and selling and marketing these essentially these all-inclusive trips and and whereas churchill started um really got its foothold with professional photographers and wildlife uh wildlife documentary filmmakers frontiers north really ushered churchill into this era of what you know, and it's not a dirty word, it's leisure travel. And we're a tourism company. We may exist on the adventure side of the tourism spectrum, but Frontiers North Adventures is a, is a tour company. And uh, we're gosh damn darn proud of that. And, and let's talk about how that evolved because it was actually your mother who originally was, was the force behind the original Frontiers North, right? So yeah, my folks recognize this opportunity uh, my dad continued to work for the Royal Bank for another 15 years, and my mom started the company in our basement, essentially with, a, and I remember a typewriter, a telephone, and uh, eventually a, <laughs> like a fax machine that, that with the carbon paper in it, and and it went from there. So, so that what started in our basement uh, in a suburb of Winnipeg in 1987 has grown to we have about 30 full-time year-round staff, and at our peaks. Touring seasons, we have about 115 people on payroll uh, between our Tundra Buggy Tours and Activities business, uh, a hotel, a pub, uh, ground transportation, our, our garage. We build and maintain all of our own uh, off-road vehicles and we maintain our road fleet, retail business, gear business, you name it. Okay, so hang on. You got. I'm looking at your roster staff here. It's fantastic. They've all got headshots. I think I want to be the tundra buggy driver. I'm not sure I want to be the polar bear guard, but he looks pretty cool. <laughs> so it's cool, quite a team. Cool. Right. Yeah. So at 100 plus people every year, are, are you one of the bigger employers in Churchill? Yeah, sure. Yeah. What else is there? Uh, well, there's a handful of other uh, tour companies that operate in Churchill. Um, some of them uh, locally owned and operated. Some of the big ones coming in from out of province and out of country to operate in Churchill, and the the fun that I like to have with those with those bigger travel companies is I get to very cheekily say, you know, I grew up here. Where are you guys from? And uh, kind of take it from there. So so let's talk about that from from that authentic destination development perspective. That's a really good place to start. Your dad was in the banking business in Churchill for almost a decade before he switched over to Frontiers North in the end, right? Well, my dad worked for the Royal Bank for decades and uh, ended up uh, uh, retiring when 
Frontiers North acquired the Thunder Buggy Tours and Activities business in the late 90s. Uh, so he ended up, you know, being positioned in Churchill for quite a, a, a number of months throughout the years. And then, uh, after, you know, eventually I ended up joining the family company in about 2002. And, uh, you know, we acquired a hotel and a pub and we've rebuilt essentially all of our Tundra Buggy fleet and our Tundra Buggy Lodge. And, uh, yeah, so it's, it's a, a bit of a going concern. So question, if you are, if you've been there for 30 years, are you, are you a local yet? No, you know, it's fine. Well, I, I wouldn't say so. I, that's maybe not something that I would uh, presume to say. I wouldn't presume to sit at the locals table at the coffee shop. Fair. Fair. Okay. But in terms of coordinated local um, destination development, Frontiers North is one entity. You talked to me before about partnerships across everything. I mean, if you want to do something effective in Churchill, you've got to work with partners. Talk to me about the last 10 years of growth because you have built some amazing partnerships. I've been sitting at tables where you've received awards for those partnerships. Talk to me about how this was a community effort and how you got to the point where you are today, which is literally reaching outside the envelope and starting to create electric vehicles and consulting services for other adventure companies. But talk to me about that decade of development. Yeah. So, so Churchill, like a lot of tourism communities uh, around Canada and the world are very seasonal in nature. And in Churchill, we are blessed to bask beneath the Northern lights many months of the year while we have dark skies uh, we have two months during the summer of amazing beluga whale activity in the mouth of the Churchill River, just right adjacent to the community. And during the autumn, we have uh, amongst the most dense aggregations of, of polar bears in the world. So we have these three distinct tour seasons. Churchill, of course, is best known for our polar bears. Uh, we're really busy during the summer as well with our beluga whales. But um, almost a decade ago, we, we recognized this opportunity to bring more consistent year-round employment to Churchill um, by developing our winter northern light season. Let me say that first, so to develop our winter northern light season. So to take it from essentially like a hobby where we would offer a few trips of the year that were fun. And, and um, for almost a decade, we worked very hard to build up Churchill's winter northern lights tour season to to stand alongside the polar bears and the beluga whales and um and so the the benefits of that i think you know there's really high barriers to entry for tour companies to get into polar bear touring there's a really uh important safety consideration with whale touring there's a lot of boat and you know docking infrastructure required with the northern lights there's a lot less you know a lot fewer barriers to entry for people to go out host guests in churchill and just sort of look up and enjoy those northern lights so in terms of sustained community economic development in terms of predictability for people who want to live and work in churchill year-round in the tourism industry and in terms of like what it ends up at the end of the day being a really good economic development opportunity for churchill and the province of manitoba and the country of canada is is uh, you know, how do we develop this winter northern light season? So that is sort of all the preamble to your question about partnerships. Go and on. one of the partnerships that we that we jumped into right off the bat, we need to figure out how to differentiate our northern lights experience in Churchill from those in other places around the world. With polar bears, Churchill owns the rails. Basically, you know, if you want to see polar bears, you got to come to Churchill. This is really it's well known you know that's just our reputation with northern lights however there's a lot of places you can go so we we have uh, we pioneered this and we acknowledge that it could be duplicated but we pioneered this experience to dine beneath the northern lights and when we first got going in about 2014 or 2015 with this we partnered with a, uh, a chef and an architect in manitoba and with parks canada in churchill and together we executed this 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 event that we called raw churchill and it was what we did is we we developed this architecturally significant structure temporary structure with a clear transparent roof and we placed it in the middle of prince of wales fort national historic site on the frozen shores of hudson bay in the middle of winter and and we would we would serve these amazing you know seven course meals 
very well appointed meals, the wine pairings, like just an amazing tourism experience. How how, how big was the structure? Uh, so this is really cool. So it was curvilinear in in design. So when you walked in the door at one end, you couldn't see the other end. Sure. So it really plays on your imagination and and sort of maintains the suspension of disbelief. And it was a banquet table, and we would host twenty guests at a time. So we did two seatings a night for those first couple of years, and and uh, that's what really we 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 earned ourselves a ton of PR. We differentiated how we did Northern Lights compared to anybody else on the planet. And we really started uh, building and growing and nurturing that reputation for Churchill uh, as amongst the best places in the world to experience the Northern Lights. So so talking, riffing on that for a second, a very cool project, a little bit expensive with a cool curvilinear venue to, to put it in. Has that, yeah, I got that. Um, has has that spurred, and it's, you know, and there's nothing wrong with this, has it spurred more action and copycats and more Northern Lights from some of the other suppliers? Are they seeing a lift there? This is the coolest part about it. The more uh, operators that crop up a yurt in the boreal forest or an indigenous tourism operator who has a dog yard and does uh, mushing during the day and has a teepee out at night in the boreal forest, or what we're doing, you know, dining beneath the Northern Lights are a few examples. The more of these individual operators that crop up, the more it, in Churchill, this is all in Churchill, the more it legitimizes our destination. So this isn't about Frontiers North. This is about what opportunities can we uh, foster to develop Churchill, the, our community as a Northern Lights viewing destination. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, the the whole concept of authentic is a big part of the studies we've been doing, you know, in the regional tourism office and at Simple View. But this idea of animating around DNA, I mean, as you said, polar bears, beluga watching and northern lights can all be part of the DNA. I am fascinated that you would say the least proprietary part of that DNA is the northern lights. It could be done elsewhere. So you built proprietary elements. That's brilliant. That's that's really forward thinking partners in that. Who were they? Oh, okay. Well, so in addition to uh, Parks Canada and Churchill, um, also working with uh, the company in the Nook Operations with their yurt, with Wapusk Adventures, with the Dog Yard, and, uh, and then on the other side of things, partnering with our DMO in Manitoba, Travel Manitoba, and with Destination Canada have been great partners in this. And then when we take it a step further uh, in market, it's working with um, Destination Canada's offices in Japan and Australia. And we're really trying to figure out how to uh, present a compelling argument for Pan Pacific travelers to enter Canada in Vancouver and make their way all the way over to Churchill when there might be closer alternatives. So some of the friction we're trying to take out of that process is as opposed to, well, let me put it this way, is operating nonstop flights from Calgary right up into Churchill and mm -hmm. eliminating time required to sort of get somebody into Southern Manitoba to overnight once in Southern Manitoba on the way up to Churchill and once on the way back, just the way that the flights operate. And, and taking, you know, as we're emerging out of the pandemic here and we're seeing what some of the airlines are doing in the American Midwest in reducing service to the feeder markets, like I, arguably Winnipeg is one of those feeder markets. Mm -hmm. And, and when, we, when we thought about this, coming out of like into early 21, thinking that or acknowledging that as we grow out of this pandemic, that airlines are going to stick to their core routes. They're not going to roll the dice on a London Heathrow Winnipeg direct. And, and uh, so how do we short circuit this system and continue to make it easy for guests to arrive into our destination and not rely and not put our, not have our fate in the hands of others. So taking a bit of control into our own hands and trying to uh, make the fun a little wider at the top and give people more options to make their way to Churchill. Okay, and, and, and right now you're saying there's it's only the Winnipeg connection or there's a couple of connections out of Manitoba? Yeah, it's, it's primarily Winnipeg historically and for, right. you know, 35 plus years, our, our destiny, or pardon me, our departure city for all of our trips in Churchill has been through Winnipeg. And just right. recently we've, we've added these trips, these non-stops from Calgary 
and Montreal in addition to Winnipeg. So those are our three departure cities to get into That's, Churchill these days. Okay. Now you did say this travel uh, Manitoba is sort of your DMO. They, they play that role and function for you. Have you emerged a local stakeholder network in Churchill that has a regular roster is, is anything more than ad hoc? Is there, is, is there a tourism advocacy group that comes together in Churchill now? Yeah, we crystallized and historically we've crystallized uh, through the efforts or uh, in line with the efforts of Travel Manitoba. And just as an aside, um, it turns out Manitoba is the only province or territory in Canada without its own tourism industry association. And no, there's, efforts there's, are being... there's, a co- there's a couple others. Go ahead. Okay, okay, well, and uh, so we're working, uh, I'm part of a small working group trying to put together a tourism industry association. Uh, Not entirely the point of the conversation, but I'd throw that in there. Um, We also have had success in the past as beluga whale tour operators in Churchill, uh, banding together, addressing common concerns, and having created a beluga whale tour operators association that that uh, operates and thrives in Churchill. Cool. All right. So thank you for the history lesson. Um, it is an amazing experience. I mean, it's, I mean, if I said to everybody listening, it's national geographic level, level eye opening, holy smoke stuff, sort of from the moment you hit the ground and keep going. Um, but I do want to talk about the innovation piece. It's really important. We spent a bunch of time together at uh, Impact. Um, you were on a, you, you gave a lecture. I was on a panel. Amazing work coming out of there. Your lecture was specifically focused on your tundra buggy and your EV. Now you managed to weave into that all of the ethos of, of Frontiers North, which I really do appreciate the appreciation for and sharing of the land, the regeneration and the reconciliation piece. But this is really interesting. You know, the, the well-to-do son of a banker turned adventurer decides to get into the electric vehicle uh, world, but does it at a commercial level uh, on the recreational side. So it, it's a pretty cool thing. I think it's a really important innovation, A, because it speaks to your sustainability and does create for a more you know sustainable and regenerative experience. But talk to me a little bit about the project. It's pretty cool. Right. It's fun and exciting. Yeah. I'm making fun of you, so, but you know, you know I love the project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so where this, uh, what sort of uh, creates the environment that a project like this can flourish is it really starts with uh, what we talk about is our purpose as a company. And at Frontiers North Adventures, we talk about our purpose is uh, being to share in the stewardship of the communities and environments in which we operate. And uh, to that end, in 2016, we published our first corporate social responsibility report based on the Global Reporting Initiative Standard. Um, in 2019, I believe, we earned uh, a, a B Corp certification for our company. And my understanding, this might, uh, this might be dated, but my understanding is we're the first and so far the only certified B Corp in Canada's uh, tourism industry. Can you expand on yeah. B Corp for the listener for a second? Just... Yeah, so the idea behind B Corp is essentially boil, you know, boiled down is using business as a, as a force for good. And it's less about the tourism industry and it's more about business in general. So your comparables are, you know, we look at it. Well, in the tourism industry, I think Intrepid Travel is the largest global uh, travel B Corp. And then, you know, maybe uh, the most recognizable brands that are also B Corps include Patagonia and Ben and Jerry's ice cream, for example. So, so this is what I like about the B Corp certification is that recertification is required every three years and they make it harder as time goes on. So we can't just rest on our laurels and resubmit the same application we did the first time. We benchmark and we improve. We benchmark and we improve. And so these, you know, whether it's corporate social responsibility or B Corp certification, it's about track record and goals and, um, and growth. So this, this is the framework that, uh, that we set up for ourselves. And, and we look at our, our company and on our operations and we try and figure out, you know, how can we reduce the carbon emissions in our business? And one of the things that jumped out at us was the carbon emissions that are generated from our fleet of 12 touring tender buggies that are all historically and have been since the late seventies, all diesel powered. So, so taking it to the next step is uh, when we look at uh, re, you know, we're always reinvesting in our capital. 
which is, uh, all, all, yeah. So we're always reinvesting our capital and we're always looking at how we can improve things. And we were, I, these buggies and their undercarriage was up for redevelopment anyways. So if we're gonna making, or if we're gonna be making these investments in upgrading the undercarriages, let's come at this from a different, completely different angle. Let's, uh, let's take this opportunity, the conversion to electric to redo the frames on these machines the axles, the suspensions, the propulsion. And, uh, and this is where we got into, like I said, last year, autumn 21, rolling out our first electric vehicle tundra buggy on uh, up in Churchill. And we're working on the second now. We've got the third lined up. We have an aggressive goal to convert our whole fleet of 12 tundra buggies by the end of the decade. Yeah, if you're, if you're reading this on, on the Snapple View blog, there'll be a picture of the tundra buggy. If you're not, it's a really a story and a half white um, moon buggy that's where you where when a polar bear stands on its hind legs how tall is it yeah so the bottom of the window is about 10 feet off the ground uh and so this is really these these machines are purpose-built to keep polar bears and people safe from each other and uh and to our listeners out there i would uh and my comms team would have a heart attack if they heard me say this but it's picture a giant kleenex box on monster truck tires and and we're getting in the neighbor in the neighborhood a giant kleenex box on monster truck tires that a polar bear i've seen the pictures literally comes and stands against puts its hand right on the window to what quite often i've seen your 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 visitors putting their hand and high-fiving a polar bear is that not the case this is uh, what you're describing is what we call buggy love and always buggy makes love. for a tremendous Valentine's Day campaign that is talking about buggy love. Well, that's pretty cool. So the other thing that, that I, I think is remarkable is, you know, as you switch to electric for its, um, for its environmental impact issues, one of the impacts, and I guess you knew this from the get-go, I hadn't thought of it uh, until I had a, um, uh, what was the Honda electric car pull up behind me the other day and realized I hadn't heard it show up it's it's the silence of the vehicles isn't it right yeah so so when we think about like what our what our environmental and decarbonization goals are that's important to us as a company but it may or may not be important to our guests so the way that we are framing this in our communications is less about carbon emissions and more about providing for our guests a silent touring experience which which everybody can get on board with everybody can appreciate and uh, so it, it really has been meaningful. And, and you know, in our, during our recent Northern Lights tour season, this EV Tundra buggy operated for two months straight in minus 50 degrees Celsius temperatures. It operated like a charm. It was, it was you know, we kind of joke around and say, if, if, if you take something that was designed to, build in Cal, uh, designed to operate in California and you put it in the Canadian subarctic, of course it's going to fail. But right. we're designing and building the, these machines to work in the rugged and remote a Canadian subarctic. So the machine works, that's not a question. But what's interesting is these Northern Lights guests, so they'd be traveling on this silent EV tundra buggy. And our guides invariably would say, like, hey, this is an EV. And the guests are like, oh yeah, I didn't even notice that. I didn't even notice it was silent. So <laughs> so this is like, you know, when you talk about good design or things that you don't even notice. Yeah. yeah we yeah. know we've accomplished. We can we got a big green check mark is that people aren't even the whole point of the EV tundra buggy is that that these enormous tourist vehicles in Churchill are able to fade more into the background of any guest wildlife experience. And they're not the subject. The point is that the EV Tundra Buggy is not the topic. It's the opposite of the topic. It's the wildlife and the wildlife experience that we want to focus on. Very cool. Okay, so you've been there 30 years. You were nine years old when you showed up. I wondered if you would, you know, step up and be a powerhouse CEO. I love the work you're doing on the electric vehicles. I know your mom and dad are still heavily involved in your council, but you're you're running this company now. Has it had an effect? They're at the never mind. They're at the cottage. They're, they're at the cottage. Fun. They're okay. Yeah, they're doing okay. They're, okay. they're going to watch this and say we were not on the cottage at that day. They're going to say that, John. Yeah. Okay. 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 Maybe, you might be right, but they're I going to the right. cottage very soon. All right. Very good. Um, <laughs> It's ha has it had an effect on your peers? So you, you make an electric vehicle. There are other operators. Um, does it up the bar? Um, are you going to see more of, you know, I'm not asking people to play, you know, follow the leader, but it does enhance the reputation. And the reputation is, you know, presented as a narrative to the world. And are we going to see more sustainability efforts from Churchill in general is what I'm asking. 
It, it's uh, I'll, I'll, what I will mention, I'll mention. So there are, there are companies that, that we may compete more directly with in Churchill where we've heard them say, you know, and they've said to me, I've had those conversations with them. I wish we would have came up with this first. And uh, but I and getting out of Churchill and out of that direct competition, uh, speaking with Dave McKenna and when he was up with Pursuit doing the and I informally refer to them as glacier buggies. But um, but David saying, you know, getting, you know, telling me he was talking to his his team and shaking his fist saying we should have thought of this first. So so we're happy. We're happy. You know, we're enjoying this first mover advantage. Um, I'd be I'd be thrilled if all of the tourist vehicles in Churchill were electric vehicle. I think, you know, what we think about is what's the right decision for the bears and what's the right course of action for the bears. And and sadly, we know that we're dealing as, as the climate continues to warm. Scientists advise us that we can continue to expect the polar bear subpopulation in West Hudson Bay to decline. And so sadly, we're dealing with this diminishing resource. And unless, uh, you know, we wanna be a part of the solution. We look at our own company, we look at our own actions and we are, we're holding up our end of the bargain. That's what we wanna do. That's our metric. That's our, our sort of our litmus test is holding up our end of the bargain. And, um, you know, we facetiously say when we're trying to attract uh, incentives accounts, you know, you build your whatever your winter boot business or your ice cream bar business on the back of polar bears. What have you ever done for them? Sometimes that results in business. Sometimes they kick us out, <laughs> but it's always. Uh... <laughs> but this is us. You know, we built our we built our business on the back of Churchill's polar bears. And so how are we doing right by these bears? And we want to be a part of uh, positive, regenerative solutions in our community. Well, and, and that's it. I mean, that that whole thing, successful destinations that are thriving, sustainable, regenerative, egalitarian. Um, you're doing a great job. Um, I think Churchill Punch is far above its weight. I want to see you continue that in that journey. Um, I'd like you to keep us informed. Any parting words of wisdom? Most of our listeners are working in destination organizations, uh, experiential development areas of those organizations, marketing areas, um, sometimes partnership areas. Any final thoughts? Yeah, I think the this sort of trend or more prominence for the destination development role for DMOs is really important. And just uh, and just I think my opinion uh, for the roles of those organizations is to uh, foster conversation amongst local stakeholders and, and going back to what Paul Nursey spoke about a couple uh, episodes ago on your podcast is about the importance of local ownership. Uh, and equity remaining in communities and solutions coming from the ground up and not being passed down from on high, I think is really a really important concept in destination development. So, you know, we, we, we appreciate and we rely on DMOs to foster these conversations and to, to sort of align resources so that destinations can develop. But uh, of course, as a small business uh, operator, uh, of course, I'm gonna say that small business is uh, definitely a part of the solution and so let's make sure they're part of an important part of the conversation john it's a great pleasure to have you uh, maybe you can come back with paul and we can talk a little bit more in detail about the circular economy nature of regeneration because i think that's an important point you brought up right at the very end so look forward to seeing you again best to your mom and dad best to you keep up the great work thanks david it was nice chatting with you